we're back. We're live for Marco and me. Not me. That's Jay Fidel. Hi, Zuri. Hi, uh, Jay. Here, here's me. I'm me. I'm Jay. Um, and I'm in I'm in Lisbon, Portugal, connecting with Marco. How are you, Marco? Hola. And uh, if you were in Brazil, uh, I would say oi tudo bem. But since you're in Lisbon, I'll just say hola. Amigo, great to be with you from the Aloha side of the world. It's amazing that we can talk to each other like this and then broadcast it on the air halfway around the world. Fabulous. So uh, so we're talking about energy. Unfortunately, Mina cannot join us today, but um, what's going on about women in energy, Marco? There's been some, some talk about that, a program about that, and um, an, ar an article about Connie Lau as a woman in energy, what, what have you noticed? Well, I think it's, it's a really, really juicy topic, uh, Jay, and what brought this to, to my attention is there was a, an interview in uh, this current issue of Hawaii Business Magazine with uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries CEO, uh, Connie Lau, and she was talking about the role of women in, in her experience in the field of being with Hawaiian Electric for more than 30 years in some capacity, and it just got me thinking, uh, being being a male uh, and having been in, in in renewable energy myself for about as long as Connie has been in uh, Hawaiian Electric, is uh, that it's still a very much uh, male-dominated field. And uh, I I don't have the data right in front of me, but I would wager that out of the top 100 or so utility companies in the United States, of which I have to believe Hawaiian Electric Industries is in that top 100, that Connie has very, very little company as a woman uh, at, at the top of the uh, the org chart. Uh, I think there's probably one or two, I'm pretty sure there are at least one or two other women at least, but uh, probably less than a handful. And it's uh, it's just still a very much male, male-dominated bastion, and uh, I think uh, it, it's, uh, it's kudos to Connie Lau and to Hawaiian Electric and to... Uh, to uh, Hawaii in general, and, and and she's not the only one in terms of a uh, woman who's at the the top. There's uh, Alicia Moy, who's head of Hawaii Gas, and uh, a number of other positive uh, signs that there are more and more women uh, in the energy industry. Uh, but uh, I mean, there's still a long ways to go. Uh, if you go to to any of the energy conferences uh, uh, on the mainland, I mean, it's still very very much dominated by by men. I mean, that's changing. Uh, it will change over time, but uh, it's, it's just uh, great to see that uh, um, Connie Lau has uh, come as far as she has, and I think uh, doing, by and large, uh, by most people's estimations, a really solid job. She's been there now for 10 years, which uh, which says something, and uh, so I, I just got me thinking about women and energy and how, uh, how there are relatively few of them, but the ones who are there I think, uh, have been making a positive difference. Well, let me add some thoughts about that. I don't recall if this was, this particular issue was covered uh, in the Nathan Eagle series in Civil Beat, where he reviewed the history of uh, Hawaiian Electric from way back, you know, to the time it lit up the palace. Um, but, uh, you know, if you look back down the field, look at the way energy was developed in Hawaii. I mean, I'm sure other places had parallel parallel historical tracks. It was the engineers. Uh, it was the men who had training in engineering, the linemen, the, the technicians, the guy who could put a generator together. It was not women's work uh, way back, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, they had a Herculean task. They had to wire up the state. Um, and at that time, I, I don't think women were much involved as executives in any industry. Uh, much less uh, energy, where it was all an engineering play. So, so as time went on, I think that became the culture of Hawaiian Electric, um, and I think you know that became the culture of many utilities around the country. Um, so, fast forward till now, fast forward to a time when the utility is more on our minds than it ever was, uh, and that women executives are more on our minds than they ever were, um, and that you know the whole thing about uh, parity, parity of pay, parity of power all that so you're right to ask the question but let me let me help on the answer too and say that first Connie Connie Lau is very knowledgeable about engineering things 
you can talk to her and she will wow you with how much she knows about how the, the way the system is put together and the latest and greatest technologies that are in play. Um, she is very Akamai about that and it just bowls you over when you have any conversation with her about those things. But the other thing is that uh, if you look at Hawaiian Electric today, I think the engineers are still largely men. Um, on the other hand, the administration has a fair representation of women. Um, uh, Lynn Inamoto, for example, um, is a very important uh, force in the company, and there are other women too uh, who are involved and who uh, have you know a lot of a lot of clout within the company. So it's not as if Hawaiian Electric doesn't have other women. They do have other women. Um, but let me add one more thing. Uh, before I stop, and, and that is if you look at the policy area and if you look at, um, you know, the government staffing and more specifically, if you look at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, um, there are many women involved. In fact, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is run by, uh, essentially run by uh, Sharon Moriwaki. Sharon Moriwaki is not an engineer. In fact, by training, she's a lawyer and a policy person. And I think what you find, if you look around, you know, the landscape here on women in the, you know, energy industry in Hawaii, you find there are a lot of women in policy. There are even some engineering women in policy, um, and they are, you know, an important force. And furthermore, they have proven up. In other words, they have made successful contributions at pretty much every level, including new technologies. Um, and, you know, and contracting and administration and connecting, um, you know, bringing the players together. Um, so I think if you look forward on this, I think we're going to find that Connie Lau is, is a step along the way to many women in energy. And in 10 years time, you know, we won't even be asking this question. It'll be, you know, an automatic answer. There's at least parity and maybe beyond parity in terms of uh, women participating in the advanced of the industry. Well, I agree, Jay. Just one kind of small correction. There was my friend Eric Pape, not Nathan Eagle, who did that long uh, eight, eight or nine. Thank you, thank you. In, in I, I stand corrected. Yes, yet. and it was an excellent so, series, by the way. Yeah, I mean, uh, and this one fell just uh, uh, toot my own horn just a little bit. I mean, both my operations manager and my sales and marketing manager, are both women, and uh, and doing a really fantastic job. And, uh, I mean, uh, just to kind of go back to a few of Connie's words uh, here in the article, she notes that when she joined Hawaiian Electric Companies uh, 32 years ago, there were no, no women executives. So she is really, and hopefully one of these days we can have her on the show, because I think it would just be fantastic to hear her in her own words. Yeah. I mean, she's really Definitely. seen this incredible evolution, and now they're, they're, now they're over 40%, over 40% women in executive ranks at Hawaiian Electric, which is impressive when you realize that... Uh, 70% of the workforce overall is male. So in that in that sense, uh, Hawaiian Electric is actually overrepresented. W women are overrepresented at Hawaiian Electric. And uh, like you mentioned, there, there, there are more and more women in the engineering departments. I know a number uh, here at Helco and also uh, both that, uh, I mean, we have uh, Sharon Suzuki, who is president of Maui Electric. And uh, there are quite a few women engineers uh, at Hawaiian Electric as well. So I think, you know, the engineering side is kind of the last bastion, perhaps in a sense that has been so heavily male dominated, but with more and more women getting into the engineering field in school, uh, we're seeing that now in the workforce, and I see that as a, as a really positive development. Yeah, and I didn't mean to imply that uh, uh, Lynn Unamoto is uh, the, the only woman in, uh, in Hawaiian Electric. There are many, and they're in important positions. She's a, a senior vice president there, for example. But also in government, you know, um, Maria, Maria Tomei, is, uh, she, she'd been with DBED, doing energy at DBED, um, and then she came over to the uh, PUC where she is now, and she's, she's an engineer. Um, she's a major force, and she's an active member of the Energy Policy Forum. But if you look at the PUC, you find that in, uh, in the previous iteration, the previous panel included Mina Morita, the chair. Um, right. And, uh, and now uh, it's uh, Lorena Kiba, uh, a serious player on, on the PUC. So I think what we have is, um, you know, a very large number of women. And I think that, you know, uh, they are the ones, they, well, of course, everyone has to do it, but they're, gonna, they're a, a, an essential part of taking us forward on the Clean Energy Initiative. Um, so at no point should we consider 
um, that not the case. I mean, it's always going to be the case. Stepping, stepping forward now, it's clear this is what's going to happen in the future. And uh, that kind of gives me gives a rise to a, an interesting uh, proposal, which would be great if we could make this happen, which would be to have Connie Lau, uh, Mina Morita, and current uh, Commissioner Lorena Kiba all in the studio there with you. I think that'd just be a fascinating conversation that would merit, you know, at least an hour, uh, hopefully, of, of discussion and just kind of their their perspectives and their, their histories and, and what they've learned. I think that just, uh, that'd be really cool. Wow, I hope they're listening. We have to we have to find them and bring them in, but let's go to a, a second point, and and that is something that you wanted to talk about on time of use. I guess time of use is part of the black box, the high tech future, uh, the clean energy initiative. Uh, very important to make the system in general efficient and control conduct, control public conduct. This is really the most important incentive of all in terms of um, you know using energy when you have it and uh, limiting its use when you don't have it. So can you talk about what time of use is, Marco, and how far we've gotten and what we have to do to make it a reality around the state? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, time of use uh, is essentially an attempt at social engineering uh, as far as trying to get people to change their usage patterns of, of using electricity. And... Specifically, it is part of the Distributed Energy Resources docket, or DER docket, which is one of the dockets, one of the four kind of big four dockets, energy dockets that before the Public Utilities Commission right now. And a week or so ago, the commission issued a decision and order telling Hawaiian Electric to have uh, essentially a pilot program uh, that will have as many allow as many as 5,000 uh, homeowners or 5,000 residents. This is not for uh, for commercial customers, but for residential customers across the three HECO, HELCO, MECO service territories for a maximum of 5,000 uh, to be able to opt in. It's not going to be mandatory, but opt in if they were to choose a time of use metering. And in a nutshell, TOU, known uh, shorthand, is where you are paying the electricity uh, consumer is paying uh, different rates uh, per kilowatt hour, different cents per kilowatt hour rates, depending on when they're using electricity. And there are going to be three time periods that uh, will be under TOU. There will be uh, the, the, the midday, not midday, but the daylight hours from what was it, uh, 8 a.m. To, to 5 p.m. And then the peak will be from 5 to 10 p.m. and then all the other hours left will be kind of the mid uh, the, the mid uh, period in terms of, uh, of the cost. So it's an effort to try and incentivize people, electricity users, from uh, to, to use uh, less power during the peak hours, again from 5 to 10 p.m., and use more power during the daylight hours when uh, the price of electricity Will, if they choose to go for time of use, will be significantly less. And I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but my recollection is, for example, midday, uh, if you go TOU, you'd be paying 14 cents a kilowatt hour or so. And then uh, if you uh, are using electricity during the peak period from 5 to 10, you're going to be paying something over 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So you're heavily incentivized to use more power during the day. You're heavily disincentivized to use power when the sun goes down. So it's, it's an effort to try to, to, to match uh, the load more with when more, for example, solar power is available because solar, of course, uh, sun, you know, the sun shines during the day, doesn't shine uh, at night. So it's, it's an effort to try to, uh, like I said, social engineering and uh, get people to use power uh, when it's uh, cheapest and more readily available and try to get people to use less power when it's, uh, solar power is less readily available and uh, more expensive. Well, listening to you, Marco, I, I realize this is uh, all connected. And let me, let me count five things that are on the same continuum of uh, time of use. It begins with uh, where are you going to get the power in the first place? <clears throat> and and, and if, you, if you choose renewables that are dispatchable, then you have the power 24 hours uh, a day. And, and some renewables, and I'll talk about Portugal in a little while, some renewables are much more dispatchable than others, and those, those are the more appealing because you can call on them anytime. 
Second of all, you can you can build you can build plants like the Kapolei uh, Peking plant, where you can you can call on you can make uh, energy dispatchable by by ramping it up on short notice. And the, the interesting thing about the Peking plant is that you can push a button and and it'll spin up way higher and give you at peak hours to give you what you need. So that's the second part of the continuum. I guess um, this is not necessarily in, in, in linear order, but uh, the third thing that, I, that occurs to me is that it's energy efficiency. Uh, you tell people on a, on say, a carrot basis rather than a stick basis uh, that, you, you know, it's better for them um, to be efficient in, in their use of energy during the day for the benefit of their own selves and for the benefit of the community. That's one other thing. And then, of course, there's storage. Storage on the utility side, storage on the on the consumer side, uh, where either party or both can store power that's not being used at a certain time and call on it call on it later. Um, and finally, there's time of use. And to me, time of use is a critical member of that whole continuum. Those five points of controlling the use of energy. Um, in the case of in the case of time of use, it's a positive incentive, or maybe you could call it a negative incentive not to use power at peak times because it's going to cost you significantly more. And of course, that's an algorithm. You could say, well, we're going to try to make the disparity in price between peak and non-peak X units. But if that doesn't work, we're going to change the algorithm. We're going to make it more expensive. We're going to see if we can change public habits um, by, by making the disparity in price during peak times even more costly. And as a result, you know, you can test it, you can control it, you can do social engineering and find a way to make this whole five-point system work. But I think we're missing time. Of, we're missing a lot of these things. We, you know, we, we, we should be further along on them. But time of use is definitely part of the continuum. Time of use is, is uh, I think, it was held up to some extent by, by the vacuum that existed uh, during the Nextera experience. That was, you know, 19 months. And I don't think we could get very far with, with the, the burden of that decision. But now, uh, I think we're free to move on it. I think the pilot should be a short pilot. I think it's just a matter of finding the right black box. And, and, and to, to just define black box for a moment, time of use is the most important part of the black box, don't you think? Uh, well, it's certainly, it's certainly a major part of the black box, Jay. And I mean, uh, the only way when you when you look at the, the typical usage pattern for a typical Hawaii home, you have a minority percentage of power being used during daylight hours because people are, are mostly away, right? They work, they go to school, and the majority is used when when uh, they come home, power work, and and from 5 p.m. roughly to uh, to 10 or 11 p.m. So the only way time of use metering would work, uh, why you would opt into it. Uh, is that uh, you either are an outlier and you you uh, uh, you're using more power during the day than you do during the evening, and again that's 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 much more in the minority, or you gonna you're gonna need some type of energy storage uh, for uh, you to allow the the, the batteries essentially to be charged either by solar during the day when power is cheapest. Or conceivably, you could have the batteries charged by the grid itself, and then you're kind of, you know, entering into the world of energy arbitrage. You are buying at one price and selling at another, essentially. And one of the things on my to-do list is uh, now that this order has come out, is to figure the uh, estimate the cost of a battery storage system of X kilowatt hours, and see what kind of savings uh, would accrue day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year to be able to offset in a reasonable amount of time, of course, right? To offset mm -hmm. the initial cost of those 10, 15, 20 kilowatt hour battery storage and see how it pencils out. I, I don't know how it's gonna pencil out because I haven't done it yet, but I mean, we're just beginning on the, on the path to residential battery storage, even though batteries have been around for more than 100 years, but in terms of battery storage that's available cost effective and reliable, I mean, we're just the beginning of this odyssey right now in Hawaii and also across the world, essentially. So it, it's, it's the grand unfolding and how it pass is going to take and, and what kind of demand there's going to be for TOU, uh, I mean, we'll have to see. 
Yeah, two, two, two things come to mind, though. Um, one is uh, looking at other mm, benefits from the black box, other things that could be included, that probably are included in whatever pilot equipment uh, Hawaiian Electric is considering and whatever equipment uh, KIUC is using, um, is that, you know, it, it's collecting data. It's collecting data not only for the benefit of the homeowner and the user, um, so he can establish or she can establish uh, use patterns that are most advantageous on various levels, but also for the utility to know what, what the community needs at a given point of day and how that's changing, you know, and how it can, it can do that social engineering um, to see what people are calling for. Um, so, you know, a centralized system of, um, of data, data gathering, data analysis, like in any science, like in any 21st century technology, will really help the utility become much more efficient. So it's it's not just the incentivization by the rates, you know, the uh, time of use rates, but it's also gathering the data. And this leads me to the next point. And the next point is, well, if we have self-supply online now, um, I think, you know, there's a risk there that people will sort of disengage uh, and the utility will not be able to get that data. And I think that suggests that we really all have to stay together on this. We have to stay connected so that we have information that could lead to community electrical, electric, you know, generation and renewable decision making. Um, so self-supply does not mean um, declining to provide data to the utility. No, I mean, and as far as data gathering, I mean, that's what uh, the so-called smart meters uh, are, are more or less all about. And I mean, uh, to, to toot the KIUC horn for a moment. I mean, they, they've had smart meters in place, uh, aside from those customers of theirs who, who explicitly decided to opt out, which is a very small minority. I mean, they've had smart meters for a number of years now, and Hawaiian Electric is, uh, is just kind of starting that, that process of, of smart metering, but that allows for the data analysis, data crunching, to be able to have much more uh, of a clear idea and just to uh, you know, for the sake of bringing this up, we found uh, a device that you can get easily on the internet uh, for less than 200 bucks, which is really quite a deal. Which allows us to uh, to essentially strap on this uh, this piece of equipment onto a common uh, standard bubble, glass bubble of a uh, kilowatt hour meter, and it sits there and it monitors the power consumption from the utility company. And as long as you have an app on your smartphone or on your computer you can actually see in more or less real time at a, at a very reasonable cost what that particular site is doing. And that's what's going to be needed, Jay. That's definitely what's going to be needed to be able to tailor design self-supply, self-consumption systems. You have to know what that specific pattern of usage is, whether it's residential or commercial. You can't just be guessing that just because the state average is, is X, Y, that that's going to be appropriate for any particular site. So we're, we're seeing uh, a dramatic decrease in cost in terms of monitoring equipment. You can go and, and put these, these puppies on and, and get a much clearer idea of usage, uh, you know, pending Hawaiian Electric moving a bit faster in terms of smart metering. Yeah, well, this is a great time. It's a great time to be alive in energy, you know. Um, just the way it's a great time for women to look for jobs in energy, and there are jobs in energy for them, for sure, executive jobs. But it's also a great time for software. You know, I'm reminded of the uh, what, what came out recently about the Samsung Note blow-up uh, explosion. You know, <laughs> problem. Um, it's not the battery in the Samsung; it's the software in the Samsung. Uh, and I'm Bert Lum. You know, uh, doing open data, uh, trying to get the software development community in Hawaii to do programming for government. And in fact, there there's a, a really interesting. A hackathon going on just finished uh, this past weekend uh, where you bring in uh, on a competitive basis software developers from the software community in Hawaii and, and you say here's a government problem or here's an NGO problem uh, let's see if you can solve it you know using local talent for software that will be deployed locally um, there's also something I saw what today um, about uh, about the hospitality industry it is also going out uh, for so what better place to get software um, for the hospitality industry? We know hospitality here. We can think of things, carve new statues out of the marble every day with local software developers. And what I'm getting at is there's got to be a ton 
of possibilities for local software developers to improve the software you're talking about, the, the analytics for all that data that can and should be gathered by the black boxes. Um, we have, for example, one of the guys in, in ThinkTech is in the engineering school, and I told him, I tell him every time I see him, um, you know, the future is not in plastics. The future is in energy software. What do you think, Marco? Well, it's uh, the energy accelerator folks, I think, would agree with you completely. I mean, um, uh, big data and being able to crunch the numbers is, is, is really important. But uh, to what extent you can get people to change their, their, their behavioral patterns, I think, is the much more difficult nut to crack, uh, no matter how, much, uh, how many wonderful-looking apps and how cool the software is. Well, let me, uh, let me switch gears uh, for the last few minutes of, of our program and tell you that the people in Portugal, where I'm, where I'm visiting now, are very enthusiastic about renewable energy. Um, they may not have this, you know, the, uh, the splendid uh, numbers that we have on, on solar, um, but uh, renewables account for 25% now. Uh, oh, actually, more than that. That was uh, in 2013. By 2014, renewables accounted for 60% and more. But here's something very interesting. In 2015, it went down. It went down from 60% to 50%. And why? Because the renewables here in Portugal include not only solar, um, but they include hydro uh, and they include wind. And it so happens that, the, uh, that 2015 was a dry year. And therefore, there wasn't that much hydro coming out of the mountains. Uh, as a result, the use of renewables declined by 10%. That's really, really remarkable. And this year, they're going great guns. Um, and this year, they, they made news all over Europe in May because they, they were able to get along 100% on renewables for four days. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a little prize they have around Europe uh, that if you can, you know, get along for X days on all renewables, you know, it's a headline story. There's a kind of competitive thing between Portugal and other countries. But Portugal, you know, don't think they're behind times. Um, they are right up there. You don't see solar on the roofs, but I think they have uh, solar farms uh, and they have a lot of wind offshore, which is, and nobody objects to it. Nobody has any cultural objection to it. Um, everyone is just fine with it. And it's out there pumping away as it is in the North Sea. I think it's even more effective here in the Atlantic. Um, and the result is that people are at, at peace, if you will, with renewable energy. They want to see it improve. They are environmentally minded uh, just as much as a lot of the people I know in Hawaii. Uh, they talk that talk and walk that walk. And so, uh, you know, what we have here is a country that is dedicated to the proposition that is moving rapidly with community-type renewables uh, into 100%, they might beat us. What do you think about that? Well, it just brings to mind how much of a contrast there can be from uh, uh, neighboring countries, uh, because uh, I do happen to know, I don't recall whether uh, Spain has any nuclear power plants, and if you know, maybe you can, you can pipe up, but I do know for a fact that across the, uh, the border, the, the, the Spanish northern border where you have France, that uh, France made the decision years ago, and they've stuck to it, damn it, to be one of the most heavily uh, nuclear fissionized, that's such a word, uh, nations on the planet, where I believe it's somewhere around 70% of their power comes from uh, nuclear power plants. So it's just interesting that uh, you've got countries like Portugal, who are uh, obviously a smaller country, right, uh, who have made the decision not to go nuclear at some point in their past and have stuck to it. And then you have the French, uh, who have decided to go down the nuclear path and who are sticking to it as well. So these are, you know, very interesting societal, cha uh, societal choices that these various countries uh, are, are making uh, to, you know, where, does, uh, where, where should their power come from? So certainly I'm, I'm much more on the on the renewable pro side than I am on any other fossil fuel, let alone nuclear side. So I think it's great, Jay. I think it's great that the, uh, the governments there, the successive governments in Lisbon, have continued to be very supportive of renewable and that it's got uh, the backing of, uh, of uh, the, the, the peeps as well. 
It's yeah, great. It's powerful. I'm sorry to cut in. Jay, do you have a takeaway message before we have to sign off? I do indeed. I'm, I'm really enjoying Portugal, and I think we can learn many lessons. Portugal is just like Hawaii, and uh, I mean, my goodness, we have a lot of Portuguese in Hawaii, don't we? I, I can't find a malasada. I've been looking for days, but I can say that you can find a lot of good heart, good food, good good karma around here, and you, we ought to take a close look at Portugal about energy, too. We can learn from them. We ought to compare notes with Portugal and other countries around the world, especially including Europe. From your lips to God's ears, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Jerry.